Hello there, YouTube. Devin here again. It's uh, Halloween. Um, I'm a little sick. Uh, a little bit tired. Um, but since I don't know if I'm going to be, like, physically sick or not, I decided to not go to bed. And instead, I got my good buddy the trash can next to me. And, uh, the, um... Just gonna make some videos in here. So you guys wanted to see some of my other Russian World War I stuff uh, for my reenacting. Um, this is one of two uniforms I have. Um, now I recommend if you're a reenactor that you have two uniforms. Now the reason I say, well you don't really need to do, have two full uniforms like kit and everything like that. Um, but having a different set of clothes, uh, usually, so, like, trousers, and, uh, I highly recommend you get a pair of boots, one pair that is, like, authentic and hobnailed and stuff, if that's your era, so, like, I have an actual, um, authentic hobnailed pair of Russian boots, they're reproductions, um, but they're very, very similar to the, uh, ones that they pretty much used, uh, at the time. Um, I also have that same exact pair that I had the same guy that made my Authentic pair put rubber soles on for when we do demonstrations indoors and stuff like that That uh, I'm not for one marking up the floors and for two wearing hobnails indoors on like a slick tile floor You might as well be ice skating uh, You'll fall on your ass very very easily um, But uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll get into it here now. This is my nicer one of uh, this uh, same uniform. I had the two, uh, I have two of these. One that uh, I let kind of get dirty and it has some holes and stuff in it because uh, that's the one that I wear in the field. But when we do an indoor demonstration or something, like when people come by to just ask about the history, about the uniform and stuff, um, this will be the one that I wear indoors. Um, so the first thing you probably notice right here is the belt. Now the belt is um, black leather. Uh, it was standard. You can find some brown ones, though, too, as the Russians got more desperate towards the end of the war. Uh, a lot of these uniforms were kind of subject. Um, they couldn't make enough uniforms to for everyone. So a lot of times you will see people towards the end of the war and uh, soldiers that are loyalists in the revolution and stuff wearing civilian clothes, uh, with the exception of pretty much the belt. Uh, they tried to give everyone a belt because it was easily uh, easy to identify uh, troops by the crest on their belt as the communists didn't like to wear the royal crest anymore um, after the war. So um, this was something they tried to give to loyalist soldiers in the Civil War, uh, in the Revolution, uh, to identify them. So, um, so what you see here is kind of a top grain leather belt. It has brass fittings. Um, you will see bronze fittings on a lot of them. Uh, this is a reproduction brass belt buckle. You could tell by the shine. I'm working on scuffing it up. It's got some few good scratches on it, as you can see there. Um, but it's pretty much just a simple hook uh, is how it works. So this belt uh, is meant to be worn over the um, shirt here around the waist area. And it would have your ammo pouches and stuff hanging off of it. Um, so this is a very, very, um, especially in like World War One and World War Two and earlier time periods, the belt is one of the most underappreciated pieces of kit because this is the foundation for all of your equipment. Um, pretty much hangs off your belt up until, you know, World War Two. Everything hangs off your belt and you even see it in more modern times like with the uh, Alice belt and stuff like that into Vietnam. Uh, this The belt is pretty much your foundation for your equipment. So you would usually see soldiers hanging canteens. Uh, if you didn't have a sling canteen off of your belt, your uh, Mosin ammo pouches would be hanging off your belt. Um, uh, whatever rifle you were issued, I shouldn't say Mosin-Nagant, but the Mosin-Nagant ammo pouches were usually pretty universal and they could hold either loose ammunition or, uh, chargers or stripper clips, depending on what part of the world you're in, you'll often hear them called. Both, uh, could fit into the Mosin-Nagant ammo pouches, so you don't see a lot of ammo pouches other than Mosin-Nagant ammo pouches through World War I. Um... So we'll get the belt out of the way. Now what you see here is um, the Russians were actually one of the, uh, really the only other country other than um, Britain to have a very drab, very good uniform as far as camouflage goes going into World War I. Um, the French entered World War I with 
navy blue and crimson pants. Um, and that uniform really stuck out. It only took him a year to change it to Horizon Blue. Uh, the British obviously went in with kind of khaki, which is this kind of brown color and stuff like that. Well, this is also khaki, but this is a greener khaki. Uh, it's kind of like a light olive drab in color. My camera doesn't really do it justice, especially with my lighting, which is very intense. I have track lights, I'm sorry. Uh, but it prov they provide pretty good light as well as a fuck ton of heat. It's very warm in here right now. Um, but you can, um, you would normally see Russian soldiers and you would see them wearing their belt and they'd have everything hanging off their belt. Um, if you were an officer, you would often have braces and a saber. Uh, if you, uh, didn't have a saber, you wouldn't, uh, you, you could see some infantry soldiers and NCOs, um, wearing, uh, suspenders or brace, uh, braces as they call them uh, in some parts of the world. I call them braces, uh, but here in America, a lot of people will call them suspenders, uh, but suspenders are for your, uh, holding up your socks, not for holding up your pants or your belt. Um, uh, now, this uh, is the type of shirt that would be worn by all enlisted personnel and NCOs. Um, it's kind of like an anorak. It doesn't split all the way down and it has an offset um, kind of collar here. Um, I have the authentic, uh, early war, uh, kind of, uh, bronze buttons on here. Uh, later you would see them switch to copper and, uh, there would be wood buttons as well, um, towards the end of the war as they got a little bit more desperate. Um, the red, uh, shoulder, uh, boards up here, uh, uh, denominate infantry. Uh, I don't have any rank on these yet. Uh, cause I'm in the process of switching them from my, my really beat up uniform onto this one. And I figured this would be a good way to show you the base uniform anyways, before I start throwing everything on it. Um, but you would see soldiers, uh, uh, authorized medals were to be worn on this uniform and in the field. So you would see Russian troops on the front line, uh, wearing their medals on their chest. Um, they would often have, uh, bandoliers slung over one shoulder and they would have their shelter slash winter coat slung over the other um and then uh they would have their mess kit hanging off their belt um or tied on a rope uh slung around their shoulder as well uh the Russian uh, uniform requirements, especially as the war went on, became very, very lax, and how you carried your equipment and stuff was very uh, different. Uh, most soldiers, um, I'll probably do a video on it, would carry the Veshimok, which is kind of like a bag uh, with straps on it. It'd be like a cinch sack here in the United States. You see a lot of people wear to the gym, uh, where it's pretty much just got the two straps, and it has the pull tie, and it has like that sphincter that closes up the top. That is pretty much like the Russian one, except the Russian one didn't have the pull tabs, had a belt you would wrap around the top to hold it shut and one external pouch on it to hold your identification papers. Um, there were some other packs issued to various units and frontier troops, troops that would be out longer and um, special forces troops like uh, uh, trench raiders and stuff like that would be get usually get larger packs and uh, foragers would also get larger packs because they were away from the lines a lot longer uh, because trenches weren't really used in the uh, Eastern Front in World War I. Um, because uh, the Eastern Front in World War I was a lot more mobile than in the Western Front. So the lines changed quite easily with the seasons and, and uh, the battles. So some soldiers uh, from better uh, units like... Um, um, the Tsar's guards and stuff like that would would have better better backpacks and stuff and I have one of those over there But I also have a Veshemhawk too. It depends on what I'm trying to portray uh, When we're doing it now Russia entered uh, World War one uh, with a standard uh, kind of cloth field cap and then a fur cap for winter um, and a felt cap in the winter uh, was the Bodinovka. Uh, I don't have one of those, uh, but I'd very much like to get one. Um, but I run kind of a uh, mid to late war uniform, usually. Uh, you could see these all in different configurations. So uh, I actually recently got an original Russian Solberg I'm going to restore. As you can see, it still has the original green on it and the original Adrian-style prongs in it. This is an unissued shell, actually. So uh, this is a shell that was painted, but it was never delivered to the Russian army because Finland seceded um, 
from Russia uh, before this helmet could reach the Russian army, and then it must have just been picked up by somebody and stored. Uh, it was stored pretty well. There's not a ton of rust on it except for in the crown and around the chin strap points, but that's easy. I could get some WD-40 on there and get this thing all looking nice, and then I'll probably repaint it. I got some... Uh, a brand new reproduction chin strap I got uh, made to look just like the originals, but you could see a couple different chin straps on these uh, based on what leathers they had at the time as supplies were running short. Um, so this is uh, going to be the helmet I will wear uh, when we're out doing stuff. Uh, I also have a Finnish one that's black that I keep a green cover that's the same color, like a linen cover over because um, I didn't want to change the black paint on that one. Uh, but this one will look nice for when I do indoor ones, but when I go outside and I can have a chance of damaging something original, I don't want to damage something original, so I'll use my finish one, uh, which is less desirable. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, when I'm out in the field, so that way uh, it won't be so bad as to damage an actual Russian, an actual Russian one like this. Uh, so I have a new liner for this, and I have a new chin strap for this as well, and I'm going to just restore this one uh, because I haven't ever seen one that's in this nice a condition, and I'd very much like to restore this one so that people can see it uh, when it would have looked like when it was brand new. Um, so, um, but I. Also have uh, the standard Russian, that's where I was, sorry, the standard Russian headgear in World War One was the field cap, and it was like a peaked cap, a visored cap, like a lot of uh, uh, service uniforms have today uh, with their, like, dress uniforms. Um, so, yeah, but this uh, would have been the shirt that was worn by... Uh, Enlisted personnel and NCOs, officers would have a full tunic that would be split all the way and have uh, larger buttons on it. Uh, and like I said, they would have be the ones issued handguns and uh, sabers. You would often see them with braces or suspenders to hold up their belt. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the general infantry didn't have that. There was private purchases, though. Now, the Russian troops for the early part of the war were issued jackboots, kind of like the Germans, um... Uh, but they were made out of exceptionally thick leather. They were kind of squarer toed than the German ones. The German ones were very pointy um, <clears throat> or round. Uh, the Russians tended to issue a little bit squarer boots or round toed ones. Uh, they were black and they came up to just below the knees. Uh, later they would switch to black service shoes and putties uh, like normal. Uh, like most militaries did, just for cost. The leather to make those boots uh, were was a lot more to make a pair of jack boots and it took a lot more skill to make a pair of jack boots than it did to make a service shoe. Um, I have both, so it depends on what time of the year and uh, everything I will portray. And um, But my service shoes are hobnailed, so I don't like to wear those indoors, but I have two pairs of jack boots that are both rubber and hobnailed. Um, so... Uh, here are the pants up here. Now, the pants uh, don't have the correct buttons on them. Uh, they would have kind of uh, brass or copper buttons like normal. These are plastic because this is a reproduction. Um, it's linen lined uh, around the waist for reinforcement. Um, and it has, <coughs> excuse me, just a three button fly, two at the top and one kind of there in the middle. They're just straight leg trousers, so I don't really need to show you the bottom. They're not um, <coughs> breeches or anything like that. They were just meant to be tucked into your boots um, or into your putties. Um, now, the back of these pants, though, uh, they have this extra uh, adjustment. So you could have a belt on your pants, uh, but if you didn't have a belt, you could also just um, tie these kind of like you would a bathrobe between these two D-rings uh, to adjust your the length of your pants, the, the waist adjustment, uh, which is very nice uh, and convenient. It's very well thought out. Um, but, and, uh, the shirt is, uh, linen lined all the way through, even down to the, uh, down to the sleeves. Um, so the cuffs anyways, the sleeves are unlined, but this is, um, isn't very itchy wool, actually. I've had some pretty itchy uniforms. Um, but, uh, the upper torso, so pretty much down to, to where this is, is all linen lined. Uh, so, um, so from pretty much, uh, about the diaphragm down is unlined. Um, but the rest is cotton lined to prevent that itch around your neck. It has a stand-up collar. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, for, I mentioned I was sick, so just bear with me. I'm sorry. 
Um, but you guys really wanted to see this stuff, and I'll do some of my other equipment videos and things like that um, when I do this. But uh, hopefully you guys like this video, and you subscribe if you like this sort of thing. Um, I'm constantly ever-changing this uniform as I learn more about Russian uniforms through the World, uh, World War I period. Um, I'm trying to put together an officer uniform as well. Uh, if you guys have any tips or tricks or, or where to get anything, um, I'd very much like to look for. There's one thing I'm looking for. Uh, very, very, very uh, hard to find, though, is I'm looking for somebody to make me a reproduction copper mess tid. And so it was a kidney-shaped one. And it was just a big open thing, and it had a little dish on the top that would slide over in a wire handle. It was pretty much like they they made in, in World War II and everything like that, and you can find pictures of them. If I could find somebody to make me kind of like a heavy gauge copper uh, mess tin out of solid copper, I'd very much appreciate it. I'm willing to pay for you guys if any of you are metal workers or know a metal worker that could do that. Um, if somebody could make me one out of sheet copper. Uh, and pretty heavy gauge sheet copper, so uh, that way I don't have to destroy an original or use something that isn't period correct. I'd very much like to have one of those. Um, but thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you guys like this video. Uh, if you have any uh, cool suggestions or anything like that, um, or any particular unit you'd like me to portray, I both of my units are actually, well, both of my people that I portray are actually Finnish um, troops before they seceded. So Finnish troops within the Russian Empire, and um, that's kind of what I try to portray and stuff like that. But I'm open to get some other uniforms as well and some other uh, different stuff. If you if you think there's uh, anything I could add to this to make it a little better um, or anything like that, uh, please leave that in the comments, and I'd uh, very much like to. Um, read about that. If you have any uh, relatives that you know of that were in the Russian military or anything like that, um, I'd very much like to um, read about those as well. Uh, so thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.